Hello, um, good afternoon and welcome. So my name is Ivan Yamas. I am a Santa Cruz Public Library Teen Adult Library. And again, welcome to Think Big About Your Future, a Career Spotlight for Teens. So this event is part of the Santa Cruz Workforce Collaborative, which I am, just give me a second. Oops. Which is part of the Santa Cruz Workforce Collaborative Project and which I will describe shortly. Um, this evening, we will be highlighting four local professionals, and they will be discussing their careers in more details. Um, so I'll give you a little bit more information about the Santa Cruz Workforce Collaborative. So the Santa Cruz Workforce Collaborative offers a holistic approach to job seekers at various levels of need by bringing together information of local workforce programs. This way, we will bring much needed roadmap of services by providing bilingual, one-on-one, -on -one, and workshop-based support to individuals. The collaborative is intended to help out um, adults and teens. So um, adults and teens, so please stay tuned to our Santa Cruz Public Library website for more information about our future events and workshops. And before, before we get started with the panel discussion, I just wanna let you know that we, we will have a Q&A for the participants. Um, so for the Q&A, you do have to type in your questions and we'll read them to you, read them to the panelists. And also, in addition, we'll provide a survey at the end and we'll post that survey link on the chat. And also, we, for the people in person, I'll have a survey link, a survey on in paper that I can hand out. And oh, and one more thing um, just a quick update. Unfortunately, Michelle Chow could not make it to this event. However, Bruce Green, Greenstein, the department chair for construction and energy management for Career Co College has gladly agreed to become our fourth panelist. So thank you very much, Bruce. Um, sounds good. So the mod moderators for tonight, it'll be myself again. My name is Ivan Yamas. I am a teen and adult librarian for the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. And I'll be focusing on the teen um, side of the Santa Cruz Workforce Collaborative, which is I'm gonna be um, uh, creating, creating events and also facilitating workshops. And my co-moderator for this evening will be Yvette Lopez Brooks, the executive director of Your Future is Our Business. And I will hand it over to Yvette to introduce herself, and then our panelists will introduce themselves. Yvette, it's over to you. Hey everyone, I'm Yvette Brooks. I am the executive director for Your Future is Our Business. I'm laughing over here because this is life. This is what you're gonna hear about today from our panelists. I'm literally in the car driving home, gonna have to plug in and get my um, charger here in a second. Um, and that's what it's about today. It's about learning about every one um, of these special guests here who are gonna share their stories um, about how they landed in their current careers. And just a little bit about Your Futures, our business. We are an organization, a nonprofit that partners with school districts and different community organizations to provide work-based learning experiences. What le work-based learning experiences are, are things like career speakers, career panels, like your, your CMA, as well as um, um, we are so partners Santa Cruz County Public Libraries today, and we look forward to working with you all more in the very near future. Thanks so much. So, hello. Um, so, Renee, you can introduce yourself first. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Renee Golder, and I am the principal at Bayview Elementary, and I'm also a Santa Cruz City Council member. Um, I don't know how much you want me to say, is that, is that good? And after that's Elizabeth. Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth Shaw and I'm a high school teacher. I work with the Santa Cruz County Office of Education and I work um, with alternative education. I teach high school all over, uh, to students all over Santa Cruz County. Currently, I'm the IT Essentials instructor, and IT Essentials is an articulated Cabrillo class. So it means that students in the class get high school and college credit for this course. It's CIS 71 class, and we have over 15 different high schools represented in our IT Essentials course. Um, in addition to that, you might see cybersecurity all over my background. I'm also a member of the Bay Area Cyber League and work with students 
and uh, college students and high school students um, for cybersecurity camps, clubs, and competitions. Glad to be here. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, you can go ahead, Shelby. Hello, and uh, thank you, Yvette and Yvonne, for um, inviting us. Um, it's really special to be here. Uh, my name is Shelby Graham, and I just retired um, as a gallery director at the University of California, Santa Cruz, as an art gallery director. And um, but when you retire, it doesn't mean your life is over. I'm I'm still I'm still working in um, working as a freelance curator uh, for Sonoma Valley Museum of Art and uh, UCSC just rehired me uh, to teach a course in careers in the creative economy. So if anyone's interested in the creative uh, workforce, I'd love to help you help you out in that. Um, but I have taught high school. I have taught high school for ten years and. I taught at Cabrillo uh, for a few photo classes, and um, and I taught high school at a digital magnet school um, in the early '90s when we were all learning about computers and digital work. Uh, so that was really exciting. And um, but so we'll I'll go on to detail as we as we move forward. Thanks. And go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, I'm um, sorry my colleague was unable to make it, uh, but so thankful that I was able to arrange my schedule so I could attend this evening and uh, share some experiences with you. My name is Bruce. Well, Bruce. <laughs> and my last name is Greenstein. And uh, I am the department chair uh, at Cabrillo College for Construction and Energy Management. And we also do building inspection. We actually train all the building inspectors in the Tri-County area. Uh, we're one of the biggest programs in the state. We've been rated in the top three over the last five years or so. Uh, we have a remarkable uh, facilities both at Aptos and in Watsonville. And uh, I'm just so happy to be here and talk about uh, my experiences and what we've got for you all at Cabrillo College. Thank you. That's what my hat says. Well, thank you, Bruce. Um, so I'll hand it over to Yvette to uh, ask the first question. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Um, so obviously traffic's bad in Santa Cruz. I mean, you can't get anywhere in five minutes like you be used to. Um, so you might have to write this question, these questions down because it's three parts here. Um, the first question is, how did you enter into the career that you're currently in? And the second part what is, was this always the job you intended to be in? And the last part of the question is, for the career you're currently in, did that require any additional schooling or education or certi certification um, program to, to be in the job you're in today? Um, and we'll go ahead and start with Shelby. And, oh, and Shelby, what I'll say is that you have about three to four minutes to answer the question. So take your time. I know they're really deep and we, we do really want to hear um, all about it. Great. Well, I'm, I'm, I've been very fortunate to have a career in the arts um, throughout my entire life, which is it's hard, hard to do that. But um, my mother was an artist and um, I kind of thought I'd go into some kind of art, but um, one thing um, as a curator uh, at a museum, which means I get to select the art uh, for the for the show and things like that. Um, I never wanted to work in a museum because when I lived um, near Chicago, um, I would go into these huge museums and I always thought the people who worked there lived in the basement, you know, like worked in the basement and always worked in the basement. And um, I had no idea that museum work is so exciting, it's like libraries, you know, there's so much to learn and there's so much um, participation and interesting things going on and you learn from all the artists and all the projects. And so Anyway, I so I didn't go down the museum path as a as a young student. You know, I, I studied art and I studied sculpture. Um, I made jewelry and I studied photography. And my first job out of college was um, they only they couldn't find anyone who knew how to teach both jewelry and photography. And it was perfect for me because I was that's all I knew at that time. And so that was really exciting. Um, I also um, you know worked as a lift operator in Colorado. So, you know, um, so I always had this love for the outdoors love, and I was a photographer. So I was able to photograph and work and then um, teach art. And then um, when I moved to California, I ended up getting my master's. So that um, really helped me 
you know, later in life um, in the curatorial world. But what really um, changed my life was moving to Japan uh, to teach at a university there. And I started going to museums in Japan and I noticed how different they are. They were from the U.S. museums. Um, and mainly because I'd go to the atomic bomb museum and things like that. But I'd also, it just changed my view on what a curator could do. So when I came back to the States, I thought I want to, I want to be a curator and it really helped change my, my thinking. And I started volunteering at different museums. And then I just, as an artist, I was able to curate work. And then uh, when the job opened up at UC Santa Cruz, um, I had enough experience built up uh, to get that job combined with all my art teaching. Um, and then I realized that all, what I've been doing is uh, I've been in education my whole life, even though I've been in the art world, uh, it, but it's all about education and teaching people. And so it's been really exciting. So I think I'll, I'll end there. Thanks so much. Uh, Renee, let's, let's go on to you next. All right. Thank you. So I, um, I am currently, like, like you see on my title, I've got two jobs. So at, at my job as a principal, I did not plan on having this job. I, I've been a teacher a long time and how I got um, into education was I went to, I grew up here in Santa Cruz. I went to Santa Cruz High, I went to Cabrillo and then UCSC. And when I finished UCSC, they were so desperate for, um, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was traveling. I, my husband and I sold everything and went to the we were dating at the time to the South Pacific for eight months. And I came back and I got a job at Pacific wave and I ran into some people that I knew and they said you could substitute. And, um, and if you took this test, the CBEST. And so I took the test, I got the intern or the emergency credential. And then I ended up doing a long-term sub position where they must've been very, very desperate because I was, it was, I was, a, I looking back, I feel so sad for those kids. I was a horrible teacher for these poor high school students at SLV. Um, for the last semester teaching history. Um, and they actually offered me an internship job there. And I thought there's no way I was, you know, I was only 22 years old and I'm not even five feet tall. I was like eaten alive, obviously. So I went back to school. I did want to be a teacher, but what I ended up doing was becoming a bilingual kindergarten teacher on the other side of the county down in Watsonville for five years. And after um, that, um, I landed here in Santa Cruz um, after uh, five years, I like, have been here in Santa Cruz now, maybe 18 years and just kind of doing different jobs, teaching fifth grade, doing um, out of the classroom intervention and assessment work. And then while my kids were little, um, I wasn't working full time. I was working maybe 80%. And I'm kind of, I just, I get I, uh, bored easily. I'm always looking for something else. So it's like one, one of the times when I was on a maternity leave, I got my real estate broker's license. And on the other time I got my, um, I started an admin program and it was mostly just because I, I never got my master's and I was like, well, I may as well get my master's and get this admin certificate. And so I got that maybe a long time ago. I don't remember, but I never used it. I did do. And then just recently um, they uh, I was asked to take this position at Bayview as the principal just um, at the end of last school year. And I've just started and I'm really loving it. It's been a great experience. I have a great staff, but it was not something that I really envisioned um, at this point in my career. I'm, I'm very busy. I've got a, my second job on Santa Cruz City Council. So that one also requires about 25 hours of my life a week. And so it wouldn't, I wouldn't have chosen to do this principal job now, but that being said, I love it. And um, as far as getting on the city council, I've been kind of involved in politics, um, helping behind the scenes with public safety and education initiatives and um, different serving on different committees like Santa Cruz sister cities um, throughout the years. And um, it was my intention to run for city council in um, the fall of uh, 22, but I ended up running um, a year before I had planned. And that was something that I had planned on doing, um, but it would have worked better more with my teacher schedule than this principal schedule. So I am feeling a little bit strapped for time, but I, enjoy being busy. And um, I really feel lucky to have positions where I can help um, kids in our community. And that's just something that I'm very passionate about is helping kids. Well, 
I think this is an easier forum than you're used to, Renee. Um, That's speaking for sure. from experience, That's right? Sure. We're much more, we're much way more friendly than others. Yeah. And as you can see, I'm I I I'm laughing. If you're watching, I too have a dual role. I'm the mayor for the city of Capitola and the executive director for this amazing organization. And so, again, the takeaway today, everyone, is to to really understand that there's so much duality in the in, in the careers you can enter into. Um, and with that being said, we are. I'm going to introduce Elizabeth Shaw. Hi, thank you. Um, so as far as career paths, I have to say that my career paths have always chosen me. Uh, to be completely transparent, I was not a good student. I was not focused um, and, and actually struggled for, for most of my life um, growing up and beyond and through poverty. And um, there was just wasn't focus on college and career. Um, there was more focus on survival. And so right out of high school, I went directly into working full time. Um, I did try to attend college, but I was just not able to do that successfully. Uh, and one of the things that I am so thankful for is that throughout my whole life, I've always been able to find incredible mentors. And by a mentor, I mean somebody who sees value in me even when I didn't and provided support and helping helping hands along the way. Had some great mentors throughout my career and fell into this amazing job completely by accident. And I'll tell you how it happened. I uh, Something in my hands must be electric because if there's a computer that I touch or a program that I use or anything, my hands will break it. And I worked for a company who was installing a software upgrade. And so everyone had to get this new upgrade. And every time I went to use the program, I would crash it. And the help desk at this company got so irritated with my constant crashing. And then I'd have to explain what it is I was doing before I crashed the program that they finally said, look, will you work in, in the help desk? Because you seem to know how to crash the program. Let's see if you know how to fix it. And I fell into IT from there, um, information technology, computers, and it was just an accident. Um, I also from there also realized that I like to teach people and I like to help when people have problems with computers. And I found that I was really good at it. So when I would, I would walk around this huge office and I'd see people going, uh, what? And I'd go, oh, here. And I would just help them. So that naturally led to me being um, someone who helps with user support. And that fell into, by the time I finished that, you know, whole, that whole point of my life, I was the information technology manager for United Parcel Service from nothing. In between, I actually went and got my uh, bachelor's degree in business administration. I didn't get my degree until I was 37 years old. And I didn't have any of the typical, uh, the typical things you do in, in high school and college. And so it's definitely very different. And I, I, um, I will be the first to tell you, it is never too late to make a shift because then right after that, I changed again. I gave up the IT career. I moved to Santa Cruz and I decided to become a high school teacher. I got my credential. I got my master's and I've been teaching as a full-time contracted teacher for almost 12 years now. And I absolutely love it. And I'm in a position now where I can actually combine my love of information technology and my love of helping students and, and watching people learn. And I'm able to be that mentor to other people that I benefited from as a, as a mentee in my youth. And so it's just this perfect, this serendipitous blend of everything that I love, everything that I enjoy, and the rewarding part of getting to work with people and make a difference every day. So I, I sometimes feel why should I be getting paid for doing what I love? But it is just incredibly rewarding. Um, and again, it is never too late to make a change because I made two big, huge changes 
and have completely loved every minute of it. Wow, Elizabeth. Bruce, how are you gonna follow that one? How many jobs have you had? <laughs> um, oh yeah, just, just wait. Yeah, I, I, can, I can relate for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, all these were really great. I was really, really uh, enjoying all these stories from my fellow panelists. Um, and what I found just right off the uh, on the onset is I realized most of the jobs I got in my career weren't me like applying or looking at a job posting. It was a connection. Hey, check this out or go meet this person, you know. So that was one of my big learning moments was, you know, is the connections you make and the people you meet is really where you typically end up in weird jobs. Um, this job, I'm a general contractor, I'm a builder, but let's start a little bit before that since you asked how many jobs. So I was also a lift operator working at Squaw Valley. I was a chauffeur, I was a cook, I was a chef. I cooked for a sorority through college. Um, I've been a graphic designer. Uh, I'm a musician, semi-professional, I did tour. And uh, my main passion has been building my whole life. I'm a carpenter by heart. And uh, so how did I get this job? Well, uh, I was building at a pretty high level. I got into building science. Believe it or not, there is a science to building. Who knew? I didn't. And so it was that awakening that, wow, there's building science. Uh, that's cool. I'm going to do that. And first, I went off and got training. And again, I had incredible mentors. Those mentors changed my life. Uh, and I hope you all have the same. And so um, really value the mentors that come into your life. And uh, I was doing the work and looking around. No one else is doing this. And I got approached by a college. Say, hey, can you teach an energy course for us? Hey, that sounds fun. Yeah, let me do that. And uh, just like probably for Elizabeth, um, I just love teaching. I've built things, I've done all kinds of things in my life, but there is nothing like facilitating learning. We really don't teach anything, by the way. Just a little heads up, there's no such thing as actually teaching. All I can really do is facilitate your learning, right? I can teach and lecture all day, but does that mean you're learning? I'm not sure. So I facilitate learning is my, my approach and I love it. I love it, love it, love it. And I went from being a very successful general contractor I specialize in building performance and building science. That means I'm all about saving energy, saving water, and making better homes, right? Much better homes for all of us in our community and our, and our planet. Um, so I, I just was at a conference talking to somebody. What about what I did? And said, hey, we're looking for somebody to teach a course like that. I ended up at that first college, Skyline College, for seven years. I became a tenured professor, built a program for them. And then I met a colleague um, that uh, my, my counterpart was here at Cabrillo College and was trying to get me. He wanted to retire and he'd been trying to get me for years and uh, just the stars aligned. And I kind of came down here and went for this job. And here I am, the department chair of construction energy management at Cabrillo College, one of the biggest in the state and the most wondrous place on the planet to live. Uh, how blessed am I? So it wasn't always this job. Uh, I, you know, I'm a musician. I thought I'd be a star like most musicians <laughs> and I had a good run, but no, I, I didn't make it big. Um, and, uh, the other things in my life that I did weren't as tangible as building. When I built, I could see it. I could touch it. There was something so real about building that I just love it. Just as the impact I saw when somebody learned something, right? All I do is I plant a seed and they go off and blossom and it's like, wow, I get to watch them flower. How cool. So uh, it wasn't this job. Did I need training? <laughs> you bet. I was a master at carpenter, master builder. And all of a sudden I'm teaching going, I don't know what I'm doing. And so, yeah, I went off and got my master's degree. And that also changed my life, uh, it, you know, getting even more education. And I got my master's and here I am now uh, teaching and loving it. And I'm still a licensed contractor. I still consult and do jobs. I love building but now I feel like I'm doing it on, a, on a, a big scale. When I'm able to teach, you know, 85, 100 students a semester, that's a huge impact. So I look forward to talking about the program. I know my time is up, but uh, I'm happy to share these, these stories. And it's really about love. I, I heard everyone say they love it. Find something you love and you'll make money at it. 
Yes, well said. Well, one of the things you actually don't know, the, the four of you, is that we surveyed our students throughout the county on which career sector they were most interested in. And they said the trades and construction, public service, Sci IT and cybersecurity and the arts. But what you all just shared with us and the and the audience is that there was all a all in relation to education, which I think is pretty astonishing here, how you all have come to full circle. So I'm gonna hand it over to Yvonne to ask the next question. Sounds good. So thank you very much for um for those answers. I think they were beautiful answers and also it shows you the diversity of like how to get into um, a career. It's like, it's not always like black and white. It's sometimes it's very colorful, <laughs> very colorful. How do you get into the career? So here comes the second question. So the second question is, what are some of the most significant highlights of your career? This can be projects, it can be achievements, it can be awards. Um, so yeah, so I'll, Leave it up to y'all. Um, so we'll let Renee go first. And you do have three or four minutes. Um, so we're kind of like a little bit, um, so we're on time. So yeah, so you take your time, you're good. Hey, Ivan, can you uh, can you repeat that? It was a bit jumbled on my end. Yeah, yeah. sounds Thanks. good. Thanks. Um, so the second question is, what are, some, what are some of the most significant highlights of your career? So it can be projects, achievements, awards, all that jazz. And I'll let Renee go first. Thank you. I think, um, gosh, it's hard to like pin down one or two things. For me, the most rewarding part of my career is just watching the growth of children over time. And so when I see kids that I had had um, as little kids and now they're young adults and in careers or um, in college, it's really rewarding for me to see that. Just today, we had the Santa Cruz High School band come and perform for our students at Bayview, and just getting to see those kids that haven't been here for years, but um, still remembered me and my colleagues and the impact that we made on them and shared memories. That's um, really special. So that's that's just what I'm going to share. Cool. Thank you, Renee. Um, so we'll go ahead with Elizabeth. Okay, thanks, Yvonne. I think the the biggest highlight or or turning point in my life was um, it was this massive career change that I made in two thousand nine. Um, on a personal level, I had just recently lost my father, and I was I was adrift in myself and in grief and loss, and I didn't feel connected to my community. And I didn't feel the passion and love for my job that I really had hoped I would. Um, I ended up moving to uh, Northern California to San Jose to take care of my mom. And as I was connecting and, and doing this life soul searching thing, I realized, I think I want to be a teacher. So I resigned from my IT career at UPS and I ended up um, working in Watsonville for PVUSD as a K through 12 substitute. Uh, Renee, I feel exactly <laughs> what you mentioned about being a sub. Um, you know, it, it was really eye opening because I went, it was K through 12. So I would have some days where I'd be kindergartner at the Watsonville Charter School of the Arts. And some days I'd be with middle schoolers or 11th graders. And, and it was just an incredible, huge experience. Um, then I discovered something, and this is a small world story. I went for my interview at the Santa Cruz County Office of Education in HR, and you'll never guess who interviewed me, our very own Yvette Brooks. So <laughs> Yvette was the person who interviewed me. She checked all my references, and she actually um, got me on the, the staff at the pool at Alternative Ed as a sub-teacher. And that was in 2010, and I have never really looked back. I mean, it was such a significant shift for me to go from um, a job where I, I traveled all over the country and had staff everywhere to a job where I was responsible for, like, like um, Bruce said, facilitating learning for these young, vibrant minds. Um, and I have never felt more connected to my community 
than when I do when I'm working with, with students, when I'm working with parents, when I'm working with partners and families. I feel as if every day something new happens, something, it, something shifts either in my mind or in the people that I get to work with in their mind. And the synergy is amazing. So that was a, such a significant thing that it, it, it was not only geographical, but it was a completely life and career changing event that has had a ripple effect throughout my whole life. Cool, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so I'll let Shelby go. Great, thank you. Um, I just, I'm gonna just talk about um, three projects that really um, impacted uh, my career. And they, they really um, had to do with uh, international exhibitions. And a lot of these, as someone said, um, you know, things kind of just fall into your lap or, um, so one of them, um, one of the, the best exhibition I worked on was called the Crochet Coral Reef. And we worked with some Australian artists who um, were great crocheters and they decided that they were gonna crochet the coral reef before it died of ocean acidification. And so um, they have this beautiful uh, traveling exhibition um, and they have six foot tall you know, sculptures and they look like parts of the coral reef and we assembled them together in the gallery and some of them were made out of plastic to show the ocean acidification and all the problems that are going on with ocean plastic and um, and a water you know runoff. Um, so we were both teaching people how to crochet because we were making a, a community reef as well. We were teaching people how to crochet and also teaching about um, the dying coral reef. And and so that it was really exciting to blend the arts and sciences and get everybody making. And it was really fun. In fact, we we'd see people getting lost at on campus at UC. CSC and we knew they were looking for our exhibition. Um, so we direct them there. Um, and then another uh, exciting exhibition um, came about um, with a project in Okinawa, Japan. And I was um, working, I mean, I had lived in Japan, but I was in mainland Japan. So I barely knew about Okinawa and I kind of thought of it as a military base for, for the U.S. and which it, it is, but it is still part of Japan, has this ancient history. And so through that, and it all came about from a box of photos, a, a box of photographs that the daughter of um, a service person, a serviceman from um, Okinawa who was work, living there, stationed there during the Korean War, um, so uh, he, she said, here, look at these photos. And I thought they're interesting, but I don't, you know, I don't know what to do with them exactly. So I found a, a scholar. And of course at UCSC, we have an Okinawa scholar. And then we started traveling to Okinawa and bringing groups of students. And, um, and through that, we created this re-photographic project. So we found the old photo from 1950, and then we had the students go and find it on the island on the islands in Okinawa and that we'd recreate it. And that's also kind of a, a photographic project that a lot of people do. So it was really exciting. That was, and just to go to Okinawa and just realize all the problems and the anti-base movement that's going on. So I learned about politics and, you know, all this integration. And so that's one thing I want to say is that the arts aren't just about one visual thing. It's not just about painting, you know, the arts are, about life. And so you can learn history through the arts, you can learn politics through the arts, you can learn, you know, how to use your hands, there's so many exciting things. And then um, just recently, we did a, a project with Spain, where one of my colleagues was from Spain. And he said, Hey, Shelby, we have this great collection at this university I used to teach in with, you know, Andy Warhol, a lot of American artists are in this collection, but um, we could travel it to, to UC Santa Cruz. And um, it just was really exciting. And I had to learn how to, you know, ship huge crates overseas. And um, that was really um, uh, exciting. And then um, luckily we packed it all up and shipped it back right before the pandemic hit and everything was shut down. And so, um, so I had to learn about insurance and financing and, and international shipping and things like that. So anyway, um, there's just a few of the tidbits um, that I've been working on. And I, did, I do get really excited. And I love giving tours and um, turning people on to um, cool projects. So, cool. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shelby. And also, I just want to let you all know, know, Shelby did um, share with some photos of her and like archiving. So if any of y'all are interested, you send me an email and I can totally share it with y'all. 
Sounds good. And I'll leave it over to Bruce. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, some fun stuff. Um, I think the first highlight for me was when I did that first class and when I recognized that I can facilitate learning. That first moment when you see someone learn and it's just, there's no, there's no thing that can explain it. I hope I'm inspiring you all to consider being a teacher because yeah, we don't make the big pay, but there is, it's so gratifying. It really is an incredible, incredible feeling. So that, that was a big moment and that's what continues to inspire me. Why do I continue to do this crazy job? Because of my students, because they're awesome and they inspire me. And that's probably why most of us do it. Um, my other big highlight of my career, uh, you know, I, I, my professional career, music is my dearest passion, no doubt about it. I had big dreams, uh, but I did go from a school bus touring the West Coast to touring Europe. Uh, and that was big. So I always dreamed I would tour Europe with a band. And the funny thing is I could have kept doing it. I realized I can't stand plane travel. I don't like being on a plane for 10 hours every six months. And so my whole dream of what I thought would be the best thing in my life turned out to be I walked away from the band. They're still going on tour after six or seven times is I don't want to go anymore. So that was interesting. Um, and then the other big one, I, I think you all you students can relate to, um, I'm a, I teach adults. I work in college. I developed a high school program, this really cool construction program. We couldn't find anyone to teach it. And I'm like, no way, I'm not going to teach that. I'm not going to work with high school students. And I took it on and it changed my life. Uh, uh, I guess my high school experience was a little different, but uh, nevertheless, I was just... I was inspired by the young minds and what's possible and that, that, you know, boys and girls can do the same in carpentry. You know, the girls out there, I'm telling you, there's nothing that can keep you from doing construction. I've seen it. I've witnessed it. And so that was powerful and just how incredible high schoolers can be. And, and, and you're just an incredible moment in your life. I was teaching a construction class. I'll just give you my one last story because it's funny. And so when I'm teaching construction to these high schoolers, this basic carpentry, and I got, they got, I was kind of told to do this job to build art sculptures for the parade that was coming up, right? So I went from building a, like a shed and dog houses to like these exotic three-dimensional <laughs> pieces of art. I'm like, how am I going to do this with high school students? They shined. I couldn't believe it, how they stepped up. And that's my thing to you all. You can do more than you think you can. That's the, the lesson here is, I, and that was for me, I, I almost failed high school. And as soon as I got to college, I was a 4.0 honor student. Who knew, right? So, you know, you never know when that shift's going to occur for you. And it might be an event in your life, whatever, but uh, it's amazing how, you know, you've got to have your eyes open when the door opens and be ready to walk through it. So I hope that today you're seeing some of the doors that we've walked through and hey, they might look good to you, but there's a lot of doors out there and don't think there's only one door. And the main thing is you can walk through any door. Don't ever let anyone tell that you can't do it. You're not smart enough. You don't have this or that. I mean, all the successful people I've met, you know, all have had problems, had, you know, either economic and have money. They didn't live in the right place. They had health problems. Nothing keep down if we have the spirit to do it and that's what that's what i saw in these high school students and most of my students so for me that's the highlight that's the highlight for me thank you and this right now here i am i was some schmo swinging a hammer you know years ago and now i'm some like some guy that you're asking to present as a leader and so um, i'm honored i'm flattered to be here in this moment right now this is the highlight of my career thank you cool thank you bruce and to be honest is to reiterate what you said. Um, it is very important, like, to never give up on your goals. Like, to be on, like, myself and also what Elizabeth and also Bruce said. Like, I kind of um, I struggled when I was in in college because I was not the best student, and also um, I had like a hard time actually paying attention in class. So it took me a while, and also I was working too. Like, I was I'm from the working class. I had to work. Um. And also I was paying double rent too. So I was helping my mother out. So like, to be honest, like barriers can be broken. You just like you have to put your head into it for sure. So thank you very much for all y'all.
Um, so I'll leave it up to Brooke, to Yvette, so um, to ask the third question. Thank you. Well, Bruce, I wanted you to see that I went and got my Cabrillo hat. I recently got gifted one and thought I'd put it on for the next question. Renee, did you get a chance to answer that last question? I did, but after, yeah, I did. Yeah, I answered that one. But I was thinking about that too, what Bruce said about this being a highlight. This is a total highlight because I think from hearing from Elizabeth and Bruce, like I was also a terrible high school student. I was so lazy. I was the youngest one in my class. Um, and I didn't really start shining until I went to college. And it was funny because it was like, I was the first one in my family that graduated from college and my mom never knew what to do, but just give us the advice of keep going to see your counselor. And so when Bruce was saying that it was making me remember my mom's advice, go see your counselor every semester. And like with that advice, my sister and brother and I were all very successful just by listening to that. So that's my advice to the kids to listen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, for the students watching today, what you're hearing are um, is that you're you are important, right? That you, what you're doing today inspires us as adults and 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 in our future and our our own personal careers choices. And so, um, being here today is absolutely an honor, and it is so immediately gratifying doing all doing the work we're doing, um, especially for for our community. So thanks again. I, I I can thank you all a million times. But before we get to that part, I have another question. So it, of course, I get the questions that are threefold, right? So you might have to jot this one down again, everyone. Um, what are the most difficult aspects of your career or getting into the your field that you're in today? And then on the flip side, what are the most enjoyable aspects of your career? And I know you talked about the students and all that sort of stuff, but I think what the students also might want to hear is like, how much are you making? Like, let's talk the real stuff. You know, can you make a livable wage in the jobs you're in today? Are, um, you know, do you have the autonomy you've always wanted? And, um, you know, let's let's get to the nitty gritty about about the, the careers you're 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 focusing on. I'll start. And, with, okay. Yeah, okay. Renee. I'll go ahead. I'll go yes, ahead. Renee, go. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to say probably, yeah, like you said, the most difficult part um, for me is starting out as a new teacher. I looked back at when I started teaching in my tax statement, I made $17,000 that year. That was not easy, right? And so it may, it we it took sacrifice. And my um, I was married at the time, my husband and, I, and my husband was still in school. And so th the financial sacrifice was that we both had to work a little extra jobs. And so we both kind of worked double jobs. And one thing that was really important to us was to buy a house. And so the sacrifice was we didn't go on vacation. We didn't eat out. We, we, we did, you know, wore hand-me-down clothes. Like our kids ate hard boiled eggs and beans for six years, like while they were growing up. And so it was like, we really focused um, because that's one thing that we want, you know, once you get into teaching after the first five years, you're kind of committed to that district. You don't get to move around a lot. And so we knew both of us grew up in Santa Cruz. We didn't want to leave Santa Cruz. And so a difficult decision for us was, or, you know, find being able to say, well, what are we going to have to sacrifice to be able to afford a, to buy a house? And it was like 17 years. Our mortgage was $5,000 a month. And if you're thinking like that doesn't add up, right? Like it was a lot of work. And so that was the most difficult thing, but, but again, the most enjoyable thing is literally every day I come to work, it's a different day, even though it's a predictable routine, but it, I laugh literally every day at work because so many, um, so many things just make me happy being here. And so I think somebody said it already, but if you follow something that you love, or if while you're in college, you find classes that you love and you kind of go that way, a career will find you that, um, that will, that, and if you are passionate about it, um, you'll find a way to get through those difficult um, hardships. But I think, you know, goal setting and sacrifice and yeah, you're, you're, you're not in teaching for the money. That's, that's for sure. But at this point, I, I do have to say I'm close to a hundred thousand dollars as a principal and have been teaching, uh, you know, 20 something years. So I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. But it did take time. It's like the tortoise in the hair. My electrician brother-in-law was out the gates making six figures and I was, and I'm just finally catching up. 
<laughs> and Renee, I know that you have to leave in about 10 minutes or so. And yeah. so I'm going to jump the gun real quick, um, speakers, if you don't mind, and ask Renee the final question, um, since you do have to leave. Um, you touched on a little bit up on it about advice. And so when you when you really think about it, the advice you've given your kids and your your peers and what advice would you give to the students watching today in in what I would consider the what do we call this the great resignation? Like it's a time of, of a changing workforce. And so what advice would you give? So I would give the kids watching the same advice I give my own kids. I have two kids in high school and it's the same advice my mom gave me is to take classes you're interested in, like focus and work hard and go see that counselor and go to Cabrillo. It's free. Like you don't have to set your, like being financially responsible is another part of being responsible and smart. And just because your friend is, you know, signing at whatever school or committing or whatever, there's no, there, there's, I, I feel like there's kind of this pressure to go immediately to a four-year school. And for people like me that were young and immature or people that, um, and, and that didn't have the financial means to go move and, all that, like there, it, you should be proud. That was the best education I had, you know, even, even through my master's, like the, my best teachers were at Cabrillo and, um, and tra transferring was the best thing that I could have ever done. And I have a son that's a senior, he's going to Cabrillo and my daughter's a sophomore and she's going to Cabrillo. So we are so blessed to have that school right in our backyard. And that's my, my best <laughs> advice. Don't try and, you know, date your four-year degree with a mountain of debt. We appreciate your time so much, Renee. And again, as a reminder, Renee is an elected official. She can easily be found at the Santa Cruz City Council website, and you can email her if you have any questions um, or want to follow up. We appreciate Absolutely. you so Thank much, you. Renee. And Thanks. any of the kids that are interested in volunteering or any questions, yeah, reach out anytime. I'm happy to share my cell phone number and chat more. Thank you. Thank you for this honor. Thank you. Okay, so... Bye, Renee. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to Bruce. Great, thank you. Um, difficult. Uh, so I'm a pretty confident guy and uh, worked on million dollar homes. I've been on large stages performing. There is nothing more frightening than your first time getting in front of a class of students. I, I, to this day, I've been teaching now for 20 years or so. I still get nervous. And so, yeah, that was difficult. Uh, and, and public speaking can be hard for everyone. But let me tell you, when you get in your teaching and you you have a role, you have a responsibility and it's a, it's a lot. And I mean, when you're a new teacher, it's, it's really hard. So take it easy on, on your new teachers or your well, take it easy on all your teachers. But it's a really hard. And so that that was really hard for me to, to get the confidence. And I think that's with any job. You know, where you can do the job, but are you confident? Are you confident and comfortable? Right. So I got confident. I wasn't comfortable for a while. Now I'm mature. I'm confident. I'm comfortable. And I enjoy the job at a whole nother level. I always enjoyed it, but my enjoyment has increased exponentially as I've gotten better at my job. Um, the most enjoyable, uh, I think most professors and educators will say this June and July. <laughs> All right, I work a 10 month contract, I get two months off and I get about three weeks off in the winter. I like my vacations. I don't wanna work somewhere where I get two weeks, three weeks a year, that doesn't work for me. And so I really like the schedule and I teach night classes. Uh, it's demanding, but I do have a little bit of my mornings to myself and then I work in the nights. Um, I like the schedule. So a schedule is important as well. Um, it's interesting though, in terms of salary, and I'm happy that someone brought up the go to community college because you're going to make more money going into a career technical education program like mine, construction, energy management, uh, welding, all these trades, plumbing, electrical, they pay very well. I started off at 25 an hour. I was working at about 45 an hour. And then when I got my license, when I became a contractor, I was working immediately at 80. And within a few years, I was uh, charging 110, 120. At my level now, if I was still doing my company, I would be at about 150 an hour, right? Really good money. So I get paid very good money, but uh, I, good, I make good money. I was very successful in my contracting business. And in a way, I'm blessed because that allowed me to go into teaching. I had made the money. I kind of bought my house. And I wish I made more money. 
but even now I'm a, I'm, I'm a professor that's been teaching 20 years and I'm also about 90,000. I'm about 95,000 and I get really good benefits with my job and I have a great schedule. I work 10 months, right? So it's not a bad, not a bad uh, salary for that. Uh, but I really want to just, you know, emphasize how much money people make in construction and the trades. And it's no longer just swinging hammers and physical. There's all kinds of sophisticated computer. You can do computers, you can do design and illustration. There's just a world of jobs for you in this industry. And they're, they, they're just super high demand. You all know the state kind of went on fire. Anyone see that? Well, we have to rebuild all that. And so there's lots of work for everyone. So come on down, check it out. Not just mine, we have 23, 23 different career technical education programs at Cabrillo. Uh, so we're right there, like you said, in our backyard. So it's not just my program, all of them, and they all pay well. I know in my trade, you get paid very well. And I've enjoyed that and I, it allowed me to teach. So I'm, I'm very thankful. Thank you. Bruce, I just have a follow-up question. If a student was a senior right now, how would they get into the trades program at Cabrillo? What do you mean, like, come on down? What does that mean? Yeah, well, first, you know, engage with us. You know, we're, we're, we're here to serve the community and we want our high schoolers, even our anyone, really, we serve the whole community. So come on down and see what we have, see our facilities. Uh, you can meet with me. Um, you can meet with a counselor, which is even what I really advise you to do. Uh, and then, you know, you get, you get, you get your plan in place. So when you do graduate high school, you can take classes. You can also take classes when you're in high school, right? Uh, I, I, you know, I know a lot of students come from the high school and take classes. And we also have a lot of programs for high schoolers. I usually run a summer energy camp. We haven't ran it because of COVID, but I hope that's going to come back and, you know, we'll have more offerings for high school students. So there's a way to get involved, uh, even if you're in high school with our college. And, uh, and the first thing is just, hey, you know, I, I'll provide you my contact. I'm happy to talk with you. I'm happy to talk with your parents and have a chat about what's possible at Cabrillo and in my department or any department. Uh, I think that's the first step for sure, but um, just come on by. <laughs> Great. You know, give us a call, get on the line. I'll be there tomorrow. Me. I'll be there tomorrow. I'm, 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 for you. I'm down to make $150 an hour. I don't know I'm who else is right? And they're paying more and more <laughs> the demand, you know, they're really the weight, their wage just continues to, to go up. Yeah. And I our students you. are getting higher to and another real, I mean, honestly, our students are getting hired immediately. There is mm -hmm. literally, they, they're waiting for them to graduate. That, that's how high the demand is. And that's how good we train too. Yeah. <laughs> Shelby, you're next. And I mean, I've already heard several things about the most enjoyable aspects, but please tell me more. And, and, and again, tell us what were some of the difficult um, or the challenges of, of your career. Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> The, the most difficult, um, you know, as a, as a director is trying to please all of the people all of the, all of the time. And, um, you know, that can mean administration. Sometimes they're the hardest to please and, um, but, or the funders, the donors, the people you have to raise money and um, all these things. But um, the other thing that was really is, con continues to be difficult in the arts is I constantly have to explain the value of the arts. And I even did it today about, you can learn history, you can learn about science through art. You know, we always have to quantify what does art serve um, because it's, um, it's not always the essential, you know, and um, who are the essential workers and things like that. So there's a big um, push for um, arts movements to say, hey, artists are essential workers. We need, you know, people need some emotional support and things like that. And, you know, what do the arts serve uh, the community? You know, after, during the pandemic, a lot of people took up the arts and things. Uh, so that's an ongoing battle. And it, so it, it's difficult, but it's, it's almost like you have to kind of keep replaying the message. People understand that the arts are important, but, you know, they don't, it doesn't have that dollar figure. And, and the, the money is, isn't always there, you know, and when I was teaching high school in, and over the hill in um, Silicon Valley, and I was, you know, my small salary, and then the kids were graduating and working for Silicon chip makers, and they were just making good money right out of high school. This was in the 90s. So, um, you know, thing, 
times have changed and, um, you know, but I stuck with my career and um, always, I always worked. I was always, you know, kind of a worker. And um, in fact, the janitor, the custodians wouldn't let me in the art room. I, they thought I was too young. I had to jingle my keys and shake, you know, shake their hand to let them, to let me in. Um, so, you know, just this perseverance and now uh, over time after a combination of, you know, 30 year plus years plus in, in organized schools, I was able to combine all my retirements and uh, and then now just work on freelance work. So I like that. Now I'm working on contracts and I can uh, work work by uh, project based things. So I'm, I'm, you know, able to do that, uh, able to make uh, the financial end, um, but you have to stick with it. But and of course, the most enjoyable is working with the students, though, and seeing that um, highlight. Like I even taught a, a lot of um, young women artists, you know, how to use a, um, a drill, a drill, you know, that they weren't used to doing that. But it, when we in the gallery, you know, we use levels and drills and all the building materials, things like that. And um, anyway, so little um, things like that are really exciting um, to, to teach people um, how to do that, how to actually hang the art, because a lot of people don't think about that um, in the, um, you know, the making of it. And then you walk into a museum and it's kind of seamless. You're like, oh, wow. Well, and they're shocked at how long, wow, this took a long time. I can't believe how long it took <laughs> to hang this. And now we hang video monitors and, you know, big screens and the whole, whole different thing. So um, anyway, so that's, there's, there's a lot of challenges, um, but the, the rewards are, are there as well. Well, your work most certainly makes the world more beautiful every day. So I appreciate that insight. There's so many artists out there and there's so many ways to get involved. And it sounds like a, a, the same song, right? That it takes time. You have to, to be willing to change your direction and, and evolve with the times. And, and you're, definitely, um, you're definitely sharing that story. So thank you. Uh, okay, Elizabeth. What are the most difficult aspects of your career or getting into the field? And what are the most enjoyable parts of it? Well, I will say, um, I'll say this first. Right now, we need teachers. So <laughs> it's very easy to get into teaching. Uh, but no, it's not actually easy to be a teacher. Um, the, one of the things that, that Renee mentioned and, and Bruce and, and the salary of, of teachers is just, um, it, it's just difficult. Um, you are expected to have a bachelor's degree and, and a credential and two years of experience. And by that point, you should be earning X amount of money, but teachers start at about 35, 37,000 with all that education. Um, and so it is a choice. So the benefits, the payoffs that, you know, Bruce had mentioned is yes, you can have a two months off in the middle of the summer. And then the other payoff is, you know, you do things that, um, like you work summer school, I'll, I'll teach summer school and earn extra money. So although my contract is after 10, after 11 years, and it's about $70,000 for my contract, I can supplement that for summers. I also have the opportunity, and this is for those of you who uh, I know everyone knows the term side hustle. So a side hustle is an amazing thing because you're able to, um, to do something you enjoy, maybe on an independent contract basis, and you can work a side hustle to um, you know, pay for a trip. And I was blessed enough to work with the Bay Area Cyber Patriots and do a whole a series of summertime uh, work in cybersecurity. And that connected me to an entire group of educators at Cabrillo College, and it opened up opportunities. So although the salary of a teacher or in, in that field, it's definitely a choice. And there are other things that you can do. So if your salary isn't where you want it to be, you can always work on something that you enjoy and the opportunities will present themselves. Now on the other, on the other um, track is what's enjoyable. Um, I've been loving working in cybersecurity. It's education, it's, it's training, but it's also an incredibly exciting and ever expanding field. 
And so the what we're training students in our cyber camps and how we're um, letting people know about how to be a digital citizen and be secure with cryptocurrency going off the charts and digital hacks and malware everywhere, getting people to know about cutting edge security practices is an incredibly enjoyable part of my job. And I absolutely love doing that. And it's a really lucrative side hustle. So there you go. I am all about the side hustles. If you can count how many jobs I have today, my goodness. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to use this as an opportunity to describe the program um, you currently work in and how that's available to our audience? Absolutely. So um, I, I have a one program that I'm incredibly excited about, and this is a partnership with the Santa Cruz County Office of Education and also all of the local school districts, PVUSD, SLVUSD, Scotts Valley Unified, Santa Cruz City Schools, all of them working together to bring about an IT essential career pathway. And it's, uh, it's, it's an, an essentially information and communication technology pathway. And it allows students to focus on building all the important parts of a technology career that will allow you to explore in multiple areas. So ultimately the goal is to have students choose from a series of pathways involving information, computers, communication, and technology. So the very first sort of core stone or foundational course is IT Essentials. And IT Essentials is a career technical education course that is articulated through Cabrillo College. So what does that mean in real talk? Just means that Cabrillo College has instructors and has um, agreements with the high schools to have an instructor teach the course. And it's articulated so students have the opportunity of earning college credit while they're in high school. A little bit different from dual enrollment, but very similar concepts. And it's a full year program. So you would take an IT essentials class for a year and that's equivalent to Cabrillo's CIS 71, which you'd have to take in a semester. So you get a longer time to take it. You get to work with students of your own age at multiple high schools. We currently have 15 different high schools represented in our IT Essentials course, which is in its first semester. We're just about to wrap up the first semester and go into semester two. Then from there, you'll actually have the opportunity to choose three different pathway courses or four different pathway courses in cybersecurity, in networking, in advanced programming. So this is an incredible opportunity for Santa Cruz students to figure out, number one, what do I like about computers? Is there a passion? Do I, and, and anyone can gain knowledge and benefit from computer engineering and computer science and cybersecurity because you can take it anywhere. Any entrepreneur needs to know about cybersecurity. So really what you would want to do is go to our website, which is the Santa, it's IT essential, IT is essential dot Santa Cruz org, And I will um, give you the link, but you really want to see what we have to offer. It's computer science information. And I would say that for any student, maybe you're not interested in cybersecurity. Maybe you're not interested in technology. Your high school has amazing career technical education courses. You can get information about anything you want to do. And your high school, I guarantee you in Santa Cruz County, your high school has things to support. So look at our, our website. Uh, you'll be share, I'll share that with Yvette. She can send you the information. Just sign up for information about how to join the ICT network path and it help jumpstart your Cabrillo College career and have fun with, with uh, information technology along the way. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. What, what's really important here, the message here is I, it makes me think about my time in high school and I participated in a medical magnet um, program. And my whole dream was that I was gonna enter into the medical field. The, the mentorship and the guidance and the, the focus that it gave me 
um, really allowed me to um, obtain what we call these transferable skill sets. And so although I did not become the doctor that I thought I wanted to be, um, it allowed me to explore different things um, down the road and to really network. And, and I'm, if we don't have too many questions later, I'm going to plant the seed now as you're thinking about what networking means to you. But we have one more question from Yvonne. Are you ready, Yvonne? Yes, I am. All right. So, um, cool. So last question, and Renee already answered this. Oh, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your experience, your, um, your experience, your, um, and your answers. I think they're very, very, um, you kind of like share the whole totality of the co career. And I think it's much needed, um, especially for like the teens to actually like, know, like, oh yeah, this is the reality of this career. So thank you very much. Um, so the fourth question is that, um, if you have any advice you would like to give to aspiring teens who are looking into your career, and we can start off with Elizabeth. I would say look around and, you know, I'm just going to echo what other panelists have said. Find what you love and do that and you will find ways to get paid for it. But I also um, want to say that, you know, in my motto, it's never too late to change your career. But on the flip side, it's also never too early to start. Um, I have if students in my IT essentials program class. They're in ninth grade. I have students in ninth grade who are taking a college class. I have students in 12th grade who are taking the college class. Go look at all that Cabrillo has to offer. Maybe a dual enrollment course, maybe a summer course. It's free. The services are incredible and you will find out what your passions are and you'll find out what you enjoy. And also, like Yvette said, you'll, you'll gain uh, practical information of how to apply real world things. Because the first time you go and put your first college application in and do your schedule and choose your, your class and meet your professor, all that is real world things that adults do. And so you'll get practical ap applicable skills and you'll find what you enjoy. So I would just encourage you to look around at what you enjoy, find a mentor, find someone who can support you and open your, your, your communication network and be open to the opportunities because they will find you if you're open to them. Good, cool, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, sounds good, so I'll hand it over to Shelby. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I think that, um, that everyone should remember that um, all all of the jobs and things you do uh, accumulate to help your career. So um, kind of one thing leads to another. So don't feel like, oh, I'm, just, I'm wasting time over here. You might realize later on, like why you were doing that or um, all these things kind of add up to, to kind of build what you do. Like, you know, like Elizabeth, you know, all, the, all those things, your computer things connected together, you know. So, of course, you kind of we all have to go through this path, but we you don't know about it while you're doing it and you can look back. So just know that you're doing things for a reason or you'll try to make the connections and also um, really if you want to work at the either the best museum or the best um, music center in town or if you want to work for adobe and you want to or you want to work for pixar and do animation you know just go to those places and try to get an internship i mean just go to the top is my advice or go to the not go to the place you want to go and you'd be surprised when people see how awesome you are, then they want to hire you. Um, so you do have to like show up though, and you have to kind of be there, but don't feel like you can't go to that, that place. Um, so, um, so I really want to encourage people to just imagine, you know, use that, your imagination, where can I see myself? And if you visualize it, you know, it, it, it does happen. Um, I, I've seen it happen. And so it's pretty exciting to, um, to see students launch their careers and go out there and um, they couldn't believe they, they, they did that. Uh, and don't be afraid to ask your teachers for help. Okay, like Bruce gets paid to help students. Uh, so don't be afraid. A lot of times students are afraid to go to office hours or afraid to go talk to their students or to get a letter of recommendation. But that is a teacher's job. 
you know, um, and so just never be shy to to talk to the teachers and, and ask them because they that's we all want to help. It's really this community. That's what it's it's about. And um, I've always seen students say, oh, I can't I'm, I'm afraid to ask them for a letter of recommendation. But I still I write letter recommendations all the time for different artists, residencies, grants, uh, support, jobs, internships. And uh, it gives me pleasure to do that for students. And um, so that's my advice. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Shelby. Um, so I'll leave it over to Bruce. Great advice. I really enjoyed that. I'm going to I'm going to take that advice. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, yeah, this one's really personal because I do so much counseling for students and so many students come to me or come to the college and go, what class do I, I take and what program and what certificate degree? And I go, let's not talk about that. What do you want to do? You know, do you want to work outside? Do you want to work inside? Do you even like people? Do you want to work with people? I got jobs where you could just work with components and assemblies. Do you want to sell? Do you want to buy? <laughs> you know, you want to work with money? You want to work with tools? You know, I go through this whole thing and that's how I hope that's what the benefit of meeting a counselor is, is they're going to ask you the kind of the similar questions. And I think that's the more important is really what what do you love or what is the incentive for some people? It's money. I, I know students, they want to make money. All right. And that's fine. You got to find out what motivates you. Right. And for some, it's passion. For some, it's money. For some, it's the title. Who knows? Um, but I think if you kind of start asking yourself those deeper questions before you think about what class am I going to take, because I think I tell my students, go out and find your dream job, find that the best job you can, and then look at it. What do you need to get that job? Then come back to me. Okay, Bruce, I got this job, but I need, I need to learn all this. Now I know what we're going to do. So there's kind of a reverse engineering. You kind of got to decide what you want to do in life really before you take classes. I have so many students that, oh, I took my, you know, a lot of students take the business, I'll get a business degree. And they, you know, most students that get, that graduate with a business degree don't have a clue what they're going to do. I hate to say it, but it's not that specific. Um, so I think, you know, finding what you like, not just a class or a topic, but do you like using your hands? Do you like using your mind more? Are you good at speaking? Are you good? At, like, I, you can't shut me up. I am the perfect person to be a professor, right? Not a good listener, probably not a good psychologist, right? So, you, you know, you got to kind of go through what's my strengths, what's my weaknesses, and what do I want to play on? And that, I think, is a great starting point. From there, it will be easy to select classes. But I have so many students that start, start taking classes, and now that looks good, and that sounds good. And next thing you know, they're kind of, I mean, I did that. I started with public relations, not my gig, man. And so I changed them easily in my first bachelor's degree is in journalism. Did it go to waste? I'm a contractor, I'm a teacher. No, those writing skills I learned are huge. So the other thing is every little bit you learn and, and uh, Shelby mentioned this and I love that. History, geology, physics, math. You might not think it's like, oh, what do I need this for? Trust me, you're gonna need it. You really are. And so, you know, try and find that inner motivation to absorb all that information that sometimes that's the thing about education. You need to absorb knowledge that you're not always into because, and I'll tell you the main one is math is your friend. Math is not an enemy. Math is your ally, right? And once you make that relationship, things will change for you. So I'll leave you with that. Thanks so much, Bruce. You know, it's always so scary to ask, ask our students or our audience, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up, right? That's just that weird question. And I think the essence of tonight is not about what do you want to be when you grow up, but just what are you interested in today? What are you good at today? And how can we make you better? What skill sets can we offer you? And all of you share different ways to explore that. Um, and some really unique opportunities that are available to all of you watching and listening today that are available today. We do have a question, Yvonne, I'll go ahead and jump on, on this one. Um, and it's kind of a really interesting question. I was trying to think about it. I don't know if you've been able to see it out there, but it's what are the best five jobs for high schoolers? 
And I'm going to just take it while you're thinking about that. I just kind of want to take a stab at this because right now your future is our business. Um, we have these wonderful board members and Whiting's Foods is a great local organization that hires high school students. The um, Capitola Mall is currently hiring. And um, if you are a current student, there are lots of job boards through Monterey Bay Economic Power, MBEP, M-B-E-P, that you can look at different internship opportunities. So I just wanted to throw those out there for those listening. And does anyone want to answer that question? Bruce? Yeah, uh, I wrote the chat, uh, internships. All right. It's not yes. like you know, the high schoolers are going to I'm sorry, you're not going to get out and get paid a ton of money. So it might be a time to think, hey, you know, because all, all, all internships are paid. Some are, most aren't. But what a great time to get your foot in the door with a bigger company, get to see real work that you enjoy, and, and you might end up working for that company. I found most students that start an internship and like it, they end up typically working for that company. So I think that's a great path for students and they get, you're immediately in the real world, no training, no, you're just like, boom, you're in the business world and you start really, you're, it opens your eyes pretty quick. Um, I did that. I did an internship for American Express and I was in the accounting doing spreadsheets. Boy, I found, I don't want to do that. <laughs> great challenge. But you know, if I didn't do it, I didn't know that's not for me. So, uh, and I probably, if I would have stayed with it, I probably could have got a job with American Express, but um I don't think the corporations were my my path, uh, but you never know. You got to try these things. But I, I think that to me is, you know, get your foot in a in, you know, not flipping. You know, I hate to say this. I know it, I'm probably going to get, but I'm going to be real. Set the buy bar, bar higher. Don't go work and flipping burgers. Don't go, you know, maybe sacrifice, not get a wage and volunteer, volunteer with Habitat for Humanity, volunteer with any organization. You know how good that looks on a resume when I hire employees. I look for volunteerism. That tells me they're curious, they're interested, they, they have a passion to learn. So you might not pay, you, you won't get paid now, but you'll get paid more later if you sacrifice now and do an internship or a volunteer type of job. And that's a great segue into our next question. We only have about 10 minutes left, less than 10 minutes before we wrap it up tonight, but it's a great segue into networking. So our students also often hear, you need a network, you need a network, you need. A... So what does that mean to you? What does networking mean? How do you do it? And um, what, what, what where, where, how do you start? Who would like to answer that question? I see your heads nodding. Shelby? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, students already know how to network in social media. I mean, it's 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 that connection with, you know, sometimes it starts with friends. Uh, other times it's, um, you know, I mentioned um, get on a list serve of, um, of a field you like, you know, like either, you know, Ocean Conservancy or Habitat for Humanity or, you know, some some field that you like. And you'd be surprised to how much the stuff there is out there, or you can even, and, you know, back to that volunteering or, uh, and then it's a connection. So you go to a volunteer thing and you meet this person and then that connects you with that. And, you know, the other thing is just to be awake <laughs> and stay, look, be interested because we, we've all looked at a sea of students who kind of aren't interested or something. And if you show a spark of interest and you're talking to somebody who has a similar interest, you'd be surprised how that network starts. And then you um, start connecting people. So it's all about connections. Yeah. I would say get a business card right now. You don't need a business card if you're telling a business. It's a correspondence card. So I tell my students, high schoolers, whatever, make yourself a nice little card, student, whatever. Get on the radar. Right. When you meet people, hey, nice to meet you. And here's my card. You know, and next time when you go for an interview, remember me, I gave you my card or this or that. And, and the other thing I want to just the last thing I want to say is really differentiate between social and professional media. Right. It's one thing making connections on Facebook and Instagram. These are social networks. There's a whole world out there you might not know of called professional networks like LinkedIn as something I would recommend. It's very different. 
the interaction and the audience that you'll have on these platforms. So I, I think the social media will get you far, but you'll get much farther if you get involved in a professional network. Well said. You know, one of the things that was really important um, about tonight for me is that our audience walk away with tangible things, right? And so all of this advice is so important because it's something that they can actually do today. Um, not only explore different programs, but know that networking is important and also advocating for yourself finding your voice and being able to advocate for yourself. And what the heck does that mean? It means going up to the teacher and saying, hey, I need to do something. I want to do something. I want to earn money. How do I do that? Or going up to your neighbor or going and walking into the nearest store. Or for me, 30 years ago, walking into a restaurant and saying, I don't know what I'm doing, but I need a job and I need to make money to live here in Santa Cruz County. Will you hire me with zero experience? So um, Shelby sharing uh, that their uh, LinkedIn is another great way to, to network. So there's platforms out there and the Santa Cruz Public Library is going to be offering additional um, experiences around these types of things. So in the last few minutes here, is there anything that's left out on your chest that you just really want to share and wrap up with from our panelists this evening? Elizabeth? I just want to say that um, every, every person who is attending in person or watching on Zoom or watching the replay, you are already at the, at the edge of putting yourself first. You're already showing us and yourself that you have the commitment. So I hope that you know how valuable you are. And I hope that you know your voice does count. Just by you being here shows that you have something and that you know you are worthy. So I would just recommend that you continue knowing your self-worth, knowing your value to our community in Santa Cruz and to, you know, to the greater world at large keep believing in yourself and keep knowing that you can attain your dreams, hard work, dedication, community network, you can do it. Thank you so much for having us here and for spending time with us. I'll ditto Thank that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so well said. Yeah. And I just want to close by acknowledging my, my, my fellow panelists and our hosts. Thank you for having us. Uh, I'm inspired. <laughs> You know, I, I came to fill in for a colleague tonight, not sure uh, what we were going to really get into here, but uh, I'm really inspired by my fellow panelists. I learned a lot tonight and got all good advice. And uh, I, I agree. I think the theme really is you can do anything. You're really at the precipice to do anything. And there's so much opportunity for you all. And I like to think that hopefully we're here to help you on your path. You know, it's really your path. But look at all these people here and all these, you know, folks that really care about you and want to help you. And so. Um, like I said, come on down. I think everyone has their door open here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Yvette. And you're amazing that you're doing all these multiple things. And Yvonne, thank you. And also uh, the panel has been really, really fun. And um, just um, echoing what everyone said, just sometimes you figure out what you want to do by uh, by learning what you don't want to do. And I think, um, yeah, Bruce said that too. So sometimes, you know, you have to try things and make mistakes and move on. And so it's kind of, um, you know, we, we all figure it out. It's, li it's a life uh, long journey. So um, good luck, everyone. So I did find a question on the Q and A and I um, specifically to Elizabeth. Um, so give me a second. So the question is, can a private student enroll in the IT essential program? Meaning a private school? Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Oh, it's a little echoey. Um, but the question, Elizabeth, is can a private school student so, um, participate in the program? So the question the was, um, can oh. a private school student enroll in the IT essentials program? You know, I think that I can't imagine that the answer would be no, but I would like to just get, get a little bit more information. Um, how about if I send you a link to, so you can express interest? Um, Yvonne, I'll share that link in the chat with you. 
and we can always have our program managers because I, I think, you know, we're grant funded. I think it'd be an opportunity for any Santa Cruz County stu um, student, whether it's public or high school, public or private. So I'll send you the link so you can get um, information on how to request more details. And I'll also follow up on this with Yvonne. Thank you. Thank you. So I think, is there any anything else that panelists want to say um, before we conclude the panel discussion? Have fun. <laughs> Life's too short, folks. This is all good stuff, but also I always say work hard, play hard. So make sure you have balance in your life. And as much as we say work hard, go out there and have a good time because uh, why not? Okay, cool. So thank you very much. Um, so I just want to say thank you for the panelists. Um, thank you, Fairy Brett, Fairy Bet Brooks. Um, she, so Yvette is the one that orchestrated. Well, she's the one that actually gathered the panel, the panelists. So thank you very much. Um, and also I, I want to thank the act um teens. Um, the act teams were um, they helped me brainstorm some questions. So thank you for them. And also thank thanks for everybody else that came to participate in the event. Um, and also like you should give yourself like a round of applause, like for sure. But thank you very much. Have a nice night. Um, and also um, just a friendly reminder, I did post the survey link on the chat. So go ahead and fill out the survey link. It will totally help us out. And also we will love to hear your feedback too. Sounds good. Uh, Yvette, do you want um, to say any closing remarks? You said it all, Yvonne. Thanks again to the Santa Cruz County Public Library and for all of our audience um, members who attended today and, of course, our wonderful panel members. To learn more about your future is our business, uh, visit yfiob.org, where you can um, also sign up to be a volunteer, career speaker, panelist, anything you want. Believe me, all our panelists will be hit up again to do this again because it's a never ending cycle of supporting our community together. So thanks again. Happy holidays and have a lovely evening, everyone. Good night. <laughs>